forever. Okay. So I'll call the meeting of the Needham Board of Health uh, for April the 14th to order. And before we start, I'll read this little statement. Chapter 107 of the Act of 2022, known as an act relative to extending certain state of emergency accommodations, was passed by the General Court and signed into law by Acting Governor Karen Polito on July 16, 2022. That legislative action revised chapter, Section 20 of Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, and in so doing provided modifications to the Massachusetts Open Meeting Law, which allow for flexibility to hold remote only and hybrid meetings while preserving public access and where appropriate public participation. Currently, that additional flexibility will expire on March 31. Uh, we're assuming 2025, unless additional legislative action occurs. As part of today's remote only meeting, all votes will be occurred by a roll call. Okay. So, meeting is called to order. Stephen will probably be here in a little bit. Who's right here? Oh, all right, I'll just give him a chance to sit down there. So we know that parking with PSEB is not nearly as plentiful as Rosemary, but in the summer it will be more plentiful than Rosemary. Better than Rosemary then. Okay. So I read the statement order and we called the meeting order. Um, so the first item of business is the review of the minutes. And we'll start with the February 16th meeting. If anyone has any comments to make about the February 16th meeting. We believe these were um, these were held over previously. We made, I believe, all the corrections the board members had requested. Okay. All right, so can I have a motion to accept those minutes? So moved. Second, anyone? Second. All right. Uh, vote on. Kathleen? Yes. Tishaw? Yes. Stephen? Yes. And Ed Castro? Yes. And, and Rob. 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 Oh, Rob. Sorry. Rob is yes. Okay. Got to remember to watch that. Um, and now we'll talk about the minutes of the March 13th meeting. Um, and that was a Zoom meeting. Um, does anyone have any comments about the March 13th meeting? Hearing nothing, and I have a motion to accept those. So we second. Second. Yeah. Uh, we'll take a vote. Um, Rob. I vote on March 13th. Uh, I'm, I'm going to abstain because I was not at that meeting. Okay. Kathleen? Yes. Tejal? Yes. Stephen? Yes. And Ed Castro? Yes. And the minutes of the March 17th meeting. Uh, again, does anybody have any comments on the March 17 minutes? No? All right. Hearing none. I'll call for a um, motion to accept those. So moved. Okay, second, anyone? Second. Okay. And we'll now take a vote. Start with Rob Partridge. Uh, I will vote. also abstain because I was not at that meeting. Okay. Kathleen? Yes. Dejal? Yes. Steve? Yes. And Ed Cosgrove? Yes. Okay. Takes care of the minutes. Have a discussion. Uh, from the Needham Housing Authority um, and then Rich Foster. Um, I guess you've brought some other people with you. And two other people with us, but um, introduce us. If you're um, on the, yeah, if the staff come out, staff could step back a little bit. We could have the NHA delegation at the table. Thank you. Yeah. It's a little squishy in here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a presentation 
by Rich Foster and his team to present the Housing Authority's uh, high-level goals and objectives for the redevelopment of the Linden Street, Linden Chambers. Hello, everybody. Um, I am Reg Foster. I'm the chair of the New Housing Authority for now. And with me, uh, moving to my right, is Margaret Moran. Uh, she's Deputy Executive Director of the Cambridge Housing Authority, but also, more importantly for us today, the head of uh, an engagement uh, that we've had with them for nearly two years now to figure out how to preserve and redevelop all 336 of our units over a 10 year period. And next to Margaret is Dan Chen. He is principal in charge of the architecting and engineering team that we hired at the end of last year, uh, kicked off in January. Um, and this is a team that we could tell you a bit more about. Um, and one of our two projects we're moving forward with uh, pretty uh, uh, strongly at this point is the redevelopment of the Linden Street and Chamber Street uh, site and uh, the apartments there. So uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to Dan. Uh, between Dan and Margaret, and hopefully me, I think we can answer any questions the board that don't might have, but we're actually here just to uh, show you where we're going at the very beginning of the conceptual design stage and hopefully get some input. Okay, thank you and welcome to our meeting. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dan Chen and I am a principal in charge of BH plus A. We have some slides uh, queued up for you today. We're, uh, we're a 42 person firm in architecture practice in, in Boston and in Seaport. Uh, one of our specialty is elderly housing, affordable elderly housing, as well as senior centers. So, uh, so some, and we also have some experience in Needham. We uh, completed the Needham Senior Center with the Center at the Heights uh, in 19, or sorry, in 2013. We completed the Rosemary Pool as another practice on the recreation side. Um, we're currently working on Emory Grover, which is the uh, converting of a historic building with the school board. So, um, so we're, we're familiar with Needham and coupled with our affordable housing elderly experience. We're very excited to be working with Needham Housing Authority uh, on the Linden Chamber site. So, so uh, I, I want to touch on the existing conditions at, at Linden Chambers as there's currently 152 undersized studios. Their the site is about 8.4 acres, and it's separated really into two two sites or two two clusters, if you will. Um, the buildings were built between 1959 and 62, and then 72 was the the chamber site. Um, there being an elderly development, there's uh, obviously a lot of uh, shortcomings. One of which is accessibility. Um, the chamber site is a two story. Uh, two-story brick building that does not have any elevators. The site is generally in poor condition. The buildings themselves have not sort of been up kept for, for these years. So, um, so we, there's, there's also, um, the, as I said, the units themselves are, are small. The studio unit, they're all studio units. So the smallest one at, at Linden's is about 400 square feet. The, the larger units in the chamber is about 430 square feet. And so, Department and, and this is a department or this is a state uh, affordable housing property and so as as a state property the the department of housing community development guidelines for uh, one bedrooms today which is what our goal is for this project is is anywhere between 575 and 600 square feet so that kind of gives you an, uh, an overview of sort of the, the shortfalls um there's also uh, wetlands currently and, and some challenges in the uh, environmental side so, um, and, and the, the parking and transportation is also uh, sort of lacking here. Um, Linden Street that you see here, it's a single story building with four studios uh, in each one uh, single story building. There's currently 18 of these on site with a uh, standalone community center. And then there's five, if you go to the next slide, is there's five of these uh, chambers building, which is two stories with eight units on each floor. Uh, a total of 16 units and uh, 16 units per building, five buildings, so there's 80 units total there. And then this is the uh, the, the one on conditions. There's a there's a concrete trench uh, with was uh, water sort of intermittent water. So these are not perennial streams. 
and which have implications in terms of buffers, uh, buffer zones. Um, we've, uh, uh, sorry, so <laughs> we, we, we met with, uh, with, with the neighbors. Uh, we met with, we kicked this project off in January of this year. Um, and we, we met with the residents in January. We came before the select board, uh, the conservation, and as well as the planning, just to introduce the team, introduce the project. We have not shown them sort of what you're, you're seeing today, but we, I'm sure we will be. Um, so if you don't mind going to the next one. So these are, these are some preliminary concepts, sort of studies in terms of understanding density, a level of density that can be supported at this, at this site. Uh, this is an existing diagram where you see in orange are the Linden apartments, and then what you see in brown are chambers. There's currently, uh, uh, I, I think those are actually not quite right, 52, 32. So there's, there should be about 86 parking spaces on site. Uh, and then what you see sort of in yellow is the wetland buffer uh, zones, both in the 25 feet and 50 feet and 100 feet buffers. The, and, and so there are, there are implications in terms of what, what each of those uh, layers means. So we, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so in, in terms of phase, the, the building really, the way we're, we're envisioning this, this project is, is, is in terms of phasing in that uh, there's currently in Linden side, there's, there's, 72, um, there's 72 studios with a, uh, separated by a surface parking. In phase 1A, what we call it is, is really thinking about uh, 70 to 80 units, uh, all new one bedroom uh, building was a courtyard. And, and this is obviously we need to be very sensitive in terms of the, the massing of the building, how that fits into this neighborhood, primarily residential. Uh, just behind you here is, is Maple Street neighborhood directly uh, sort of opposite of Linden Street is the um, uh, middle school or the uh, High Rock Middle School. So um, we met with the Butters this week um, earlier, and so we to further understand a bit of the the conditions and the situations here. We know that there there's flooding here. We know that there's traffic during peak hours in terms of pick up and drop off. There's some concerns about density. There's some concerns about height, and so we're we're looking at this building as currently as a three story in in phase one A. Uh, was all new one bedrooms, and then uh, potentially with a community center phase one B is ad additional eighty units for for anticipate about one hundred fifty units here. Again, these are all one bedrooms, and there are reasons for why there are, there are one bedrooms instead of uh, studios. And and lastly, uh, here is sort of a, a built out phase uh, phase two at, with an additional building and so forth. Total site of. Uh, 240, 250. These are really quite preliminary numbers. None, none of these are really written in stone, but our goal is hopefully to understand sort of what the site can support from the level of density. As, and, and the level of density is, is necessary based on sort of the, the there's financial numbers in terms of what can sustain this, this development from the funding and, and so on. So uh, there's currently two surface parking lots that are uh, between the buildings. We also are looking at potentially having these parking integrated somewhat with the building. And, and again, it's a balance. Um, primarily the, the height of these buildings, phase 1A, 1B, and two are three stories, potentially phase two, maybe a partial four story to, to absorb some of the, some of the uh, additional, uh, sort of the, the additional sort of uh, units such that the goal really for us is to keep as far or impacting less of the wetland, but as well as Maple Street neighborhood, as well as all the abutters. Um, and so again, these are these are quite preliminary, but wanted to, to show them. Uh, I think I have three more slides. Um, current project status I touched on, we we are uh, uh, we 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 kicked the building off early this year. Um, we met with select board planning conservation, similar to this introduction. It's really introducing the team sort of looking at the, the, the ideas uh, again. Um, we are in the middle of a feasibility study that should be complete by the end of this month. It's really looking at the site and all the constraints and potentially opportunities and, uh, and continuing with outreach with coordination uh, with the butters, uh, the schools. We're, we're looking at traffic studies. We have, we're doing geotechs currently. Um, 
uh, civil engineer surveys and so on. So all those elements next. Um, project goal really is to, uh, first and foremost, is to replace 152 units. Uh, and these are right size one bedroom units. And given that the, the sore need uh, of, of affordable housing, particularly elderly housing and the, and the long wait list, the goal is to, to given and the size of the site is to additional housing units here. And we're looking anywhere between 80 and 100 additional units for a total 250 in that range uh, of, of total development. Um, and being elderly development barrier free accessibility is of paramount importance. Um, and then the uh, and then we were also looking at a design, as I said, that fits into the neighborhood in terms of massing, in terms of the, the look, the materials, and so on. So those will be coming uh, in later phases. And and finally, uh, it's going to be a multi-phased approach in that uh, it, it won't be a, a taking all 152 units down and then rebuild all in one phase. And part of it is because there's really no ability of Needham Housing to absorb um, all, all of these residents and displacing residents sort of during construction can be very disruptive, both the neighbors and butters and as well as residents. So there is a certain strategy that we typically work with um, local housing authorities on, on that approach. Um, this last slide, or a couple more slides, sorry. Uh, energy is, is important for us. And with this project, our goal really is to first and foremost, reduce energy use rather than looking at renewable energy. So if you minimize your energy footprint, in this case, uh, using indexes such as energy usage intensity index, um, then we can look at renewable energy harvesting on-site energy such as PV cells, geothermal and uh, heat pumps. There's, um, we, in most of our projects today, we, min we minimize, we eliminate fossil fuels, so these will be all electrification uh, buildings in, in this case. And, and so we'll push that as, as much as we can. Building commissioning is really about after you have made all these promises and the building is done, we need to sort of verify. And many, many of the utility company rebates that we're looking to, to get will also require post verification. And that's what building commissionings are balancing these, these really sort of sophisticated uh, systems. And, and lastly, uh, federal and state funding today has a lot of uh, opportunities, whether it's through the IRA, whether it's the Department of Energy Resources and so on. So um, we're also familiar in looking at those funding resources as well. Uh, next slide. And, and specific for Board of Health topics, I think um, we're, we're looking at sort of the understanding the ambulance and EMT access to the residents, uh, air quality improvement, particularly with the air source heat pumps and makeup airs mechanically being put into these units are, are important with, you know, these are, these are filtered air and, and controlled. Um, the elderly transportation drop-offs, pickups at the site, those are um, also usually a, a very important consideration in the site planning phase. The community room, generally we have a, currently they do have a freestanding community uh, room building. And, and the, the social aspect of elderly development is important. In fact, it's one of those really important things. So community room development was, was a, a potential commercial kitchen, for example, sometimes we put those in, in some of our elderly development that we work, work with Cambridge Housing Authority are, are really to promote what all these uh, meal programs, social programs. So it, it, it makes that room much more sort of flexible and functional. Um, and, and lastly, the, the, often there are a couple, these, these community rooms, these social services are coupled within these, these developed redevelopments, such as for, for uh, mental health and, and tax health and, and so on. And we know that uh, at Needham, the, the Linden Chamber, there's the Needham Center at Heights has buses. So if there is some relationship between what's currently there and, and what sort of social services at the Needham Center at Heights. So we, we wanted to sort of continue to, to see how we can leverage that, that, that uh, benefit. So uh, last two slides just to, to talk a little bit about schedule. Next six months, uh, we're, we're in April. So as you can see, we sort of are at the end of that investigation site, site opportunities programming phase. Um, and then as, as part of moving forward, we're looking at schematic design, which really is to focus down on that phase 1A building. 
um, and, and looking at uh, really more as a, as a building design. And then uh, the next slide will sort of give you an overview of the entire development process. We know these types of developments are, are very long. So um, just to give you a, a point of reference, 2023, 2024, and 2025. So we're in April 2023. So really this meeting today, we're at that beginning phase um, of, of this development. Often it's a two, three, four year process. So you'll, you'll sort of see this project as, as it's uh, uh, moving forward. So uh, with that, I think I'm great. Any questions? Just to remind the board, one of the other potential advantages is we have a number of housing complaints that are generated by Linden and Chambers, not a reflection necessarily on staff, but a reflection on buildings that have exceeded their useful life, water intrusion. Um, so if, if nothing else, we're very interested in residents having higher quality housing units that don't have mold, that don't have water intrusion. Okay. So uh, I, have, I have several questions. Um, so it sounds like this is going to be mixed elderly and low income. Those two do not necessarily go together. There are different requirements, and you might have different amenities for each of those populations. For instance, for the elderly population, you're going to have three separate buildings, but you're talking about having a community kitchen. Where is that going to be sited, and what's going to happen in the middle of winter when people need to be able to get from one building to another building? Or we're just going to have one kitchen in the central building. Is there you know, any prospect of having you know, some sort of tunnel or public walkway system so the residents you know, aren't gonna be you know, going after freezing cold in the middle of winter? You know, the, the low income, you might not necessarily need that for elderly. It's really important to have that. Um, I really like that you're doing you know, something for social programming. Um, with this density here, it makes me wonder whether or not we should you know, encourage you to put sort of an emphasis on that. Um, because as much as you can have shuttle buses taking your elderly population from this complex all the way to the center of the heights, that is a little bit of a shock. And people are going to be reticent to be in you know, a vehicle for you know, the 10, 15 minutes back and forth, um, particularly if they're old and frail and really have trouble getting in and out of vehicles. So just something to consider. Um, all for energy efficiency, but I will tell you that going all electric is going to be very expensive. Um, you know, unfortunately, um, if you look at what happened this year with Eversource, um, it was more much more expensive to heat with um, electricity when the electricity rates went up by 40% uh, for the months of January and February. Um, that was not by accident. So, you know, one cynical way of looking at it, this is Eversource is pushing everybody to electricity, and guess what? They're going to jack up the cost. Mm -hmm. So that just could have a real impact in terms of your cost for running this. And for the residents, since we were administering, you know, gift of warm, and we have a lot of residents who cannot afford those electric rates. Um, is this the most cost-effective way for residents, uh, particularly in a low-income situation, to be getting heating? Um, you know, again, I'm all for going all electric. I, I know you know from an environmental standpoint, it's the right thing to do, but we have to make this cost-effective for residents here. Thank you, Steve. Anyone else? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I would follow. I agree with Steve's points for sure. Um, I also think the ventilation with these um, heat pump units, there there's no filtration, essentially no outdoor air. It looks like you're bringing in makeup air, which I think is an advantage for the spaces. They are individual units, but mm -hmm. you still want makeup air to improve indoor air quality, right? That's so, correct. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And, um, and then I think in the common spaces, I would be very careful about how you do that as well, because if you're going to have you know, group setting like a room like this, you want mechanical ventilation and make sure we have sufficient makeup air in these spaces. Um, another question is like, do we have the minimum parking needed? Because I would love to see as much green as possible right around this. And I don't know what the demand is. I know when we build apartment buildings, sometimes they do two spaces per unit or something that's like more than is needed. And I just didn't know what the demands for parking would be. I know we don't want to impact the neighborhood and you know, have people upset about cars on the street, but I wanted to make sure that we're also minimizing the, you know, sort of footprint of uh, concrete. So what we think in other elderly developments is about 0 0.5 for based on the demographics and uh, many of them depend on, on buses and, and others. Um, but we have a current assigned uh, parking from the, the Needham housing and that sort of bears out about 0 0.5. 
in terms of the, the need. So it's not a two, not a 1.5. Mm -hmm. and, and so the current site plan on the circuit parking, we're a little bit over the 1.5, or sorry, 0 0.5, we're around 0 0.7 mm -hmm. for parking on the surface lot. And, and as I said, we were also looking at potentially uh, having having parking sort of combined with the building such that we'll have, we're studying scenario where Yes, if the parkings are offset, then yes, then you can potentially have a central green between the two buildings and so on. So it's a, it's a balancing that we can, we're continuing studying that relationship. But the goal is to, to hit at, at least a 0 0.5 more. And um, I'm curious about two questions. One is on the outdoor space, and you yeah. mentioned the courtyards. Um, is there, what would the plan be for the courtyards themselves in terms of maybe uh, covered, you know, places for sitting or, you know, ways that the residents can enjoy that outdoor space comfortably given the population. And then the second question I'll just ask is, um, as you looked at this and started to think about design, what was, what's the biggest challenge in this space that you're trying to overcome? Uh, first, first one is courtyard. We, these courtyards are rather large. And so we, we often put in courtyards, one, to break down the massing of the building, two, they're very popular. We know that there's a, a real sort of benefit ability for the seniors to, to watch, often they do, uh, across the field on, on the uh, High Rock Middle School, that playing field. And so um, one, one of which, the reason why some of these buildings are oriented this way is to sort of reinforce some of that relationship. The courtyard would have social functions, uh, you can, and there's also potentially because it's adjacent to a to a street, so often there's in architectural parlance there's there's sort of public zones, semi-public zones, and private zones for you as you go towards more of the of the building. So um, trellises, popular seating, trees, planting. Um, we notice currently too at this community there's a community garden um, behind their their building. So often these sort of social activities, outdoor or indoors, are important. So that's where the courtyard uh, and, and play that sort of role. In your question on, on challenges, uh, I, I think the height is something when we is something that we're we're working with in terms of the height. We're, we're keeping this at three stories, but often you know also in terms of the the the, the shape, the look of the building, um, space wise in in terms of the actual apartment, they're pretty standard. DHCD, right? Department of Health and Community Development standards are are pretty sort of straightforward there's not not and and all these buildings will have elevators uh, for accessibility so um so i i i would say it's it's the height it's the shape of the buildings the style how that fits into the neighborhood um, is the maintenance going to be easier to do um, you know, i re ask that because you say that the current buildings are in poor repair the yeah. maintenance has been deferred so is there a plan to maintain these buildings so that we don't wind up in the same situation 50 to 60 years from now I, I, the, 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 the level of putting the, you know, so if it's air source heat pump system, mechanically, it is, it is sort of easier to maintain than a, than a standard type of system. Being centralized is easier than to go to 23 buildings that's currently on site, um, where each has their own sort of boilers for heating. There's no cooling uh, through, I think, the current cooling through window units and, and what have you. So, um, so yes, there, it, when you centralize the developments, it, it's easier to maintain. Um, sure. so, yeah, and yeah, and uh, Margaret to and jump in. And I just want to say one of the huge advantages for me is Margaret's team she has a 25 person in house development team. And they just finished uh, over the last 10 years doing 2,000 units plus of either renovation or redevelopment here. And so your question about the long term thing is, is another. Answer that you could pick right. up on so, maybe comment on some of these other. Sure. So, or... I mean, um, she, I think, is, is trying to find a stable funding source for the operation, the long term operations and maintenance of the, of the site. And the property has been um, subsidized through the state public housing program from its inception. And so, part of what we're looking at is transferring it over to a federal um, subsidy program that has generally had more um, predictable and a little bit better funding than, than the state side. And I define it as the state funds the property at about 68 cents on the dollar of what it costs the housing authority to run it. And the federal government gets you close to a dollar. Um, sometimes, sometimes it's close to a dollar, sometimes it's at 
92 cents, but it's it's much more generously funded. Um, and so as part of the financing, we'll also need to be um, demonstrating to the, to the bank that we're adequately funding kind of the operating cost of it. So right now the hospital authority actually does an incredible job at running the facility at about $5,500 per unit per year. And there's not another housing program in the country that is so lean funded, but the result of the lean funding is kind of the lack of um, investment in the chronic problems that we referenced earlier um, in, in the meeting. And this is a really an opportunity to reset um, the property and uh, stabilize it in a new funding program and to um, allow for it not to fall to this level of disrepair in the future. That really is a specific goal. Um, and then in terms of, you know, you know, the, the type of funding will be the long commodity tax credit program, which the Commonwealth of Massachusetts um, runs. Um, they have very specific guidelines. Dan mentioned the square footage of the units, but particularly for an elderly population, um, they'll have very specific criteria around um, common space, flexibility of the common space, and all of those things. And, you know, the, our goal when we're looking at the design, when we're working with the designer is to try to create as many flexible spaces so the space can change and, and um, adjust as the needs of the community um, change and adjust or as new programs come in and are available. So like we've been doing commercial kitchens with the belief that if we provide that space, we'll eventually be able to support an actually on-site meals program to help with the bonus um, issue. Same thing if we have not one just large room, but a, um, a good sized room and a multiple other rooms so we can support the staff from the senior center coming to the site to do an exercise program or to do up to do yoga. So it's trying to be forward thinking um, uh, in, in setting up the property so it, it can be flexible and, and grow. And a big part of that is universal design. Um, so, we, you know, the idea would be not only to meet the minimum requirement of accessibility, but to really structure the unit design, um, and particularly the kitchen and bathroom spaces so that it can support folks who as they age in place. So, you know, in our rehabs in Cambridge, we've been pulling out every bathtub in our elderly properties and putting in walk-in showers, and then redesigning the actual space um, to accommodate folks who may be using a walker or, or a cane, as well as folks who may um, need um, a, a greater level of accessibility care with a, a wheelchair. And, and so designing, you know, wider doors, all of those things you get get, get to do and get right. Um, and, you know, in, in a larger space will really go, I think, the great distance to allowing um, elders to basically age in place and stay in the community for um, hopefully they're entire life. You mentioned the kitchen and we're looking for a kitchen. Is this an opportunity to create a center for that? Essentially, BHNA is also doing our senior center study right now, and one of the, the top recommendations is actually a commercial kitchen at the center of the heights. So um, we do have some other news on that front that's at least a good safety net. Um, but I, I think it's an interesting question. Uh, Mr. Chair, I did want to make sure that Dr. Parker had a chance to ask questions if he uh, have me. Oh yeah. Uh, just um, but yeah, I was I was curious. Um, I, I appreciate the presentation. I was I was just curious if they comment any further on um, EMT and ambulance access. Just you know, imagining that once this is done, if it's done in the form we've seen, then we'd have uh, many more people higher than average. EMT use and I, I looking at the diagrams, um, it looks like at least in, after phase one A and one B, you know, access to those buildings might not be that easy, um, especially uh, given that high traffic on Linden Street at certain times of the day. Um, so, and this may be too early, but you know, I um, I would love to hear more about that when the time comes or now, if if possible. Uh, I, I I think they're currently sort of plan for for some drop offs off Linden Street, but as a as a uh, curb cut in so that there's it's not taking or parking right on on Linden Street. That's one of the options. There are potentially also some some ideas about accessing from the side. This is in concert with fire truck access as well. That's necessary for this for these buildings. So. The, the parking and the area behind may potentially also be sort of 
paid was was wheel bearing low ability but not necessarily a, 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 a concrete asphalt and what have you so the goal here too is to is to minimize uh, the the non pervious services as well and I, I will mention that as part of this project we're required to put in storm water management so any runoff will be sort of retained on site and before it's released to into the system the infrastructure mm -hmm. um, and then this, this we hear from the residents of others that flooding in in this area is quite severe and so that that's one of the, the, the questions but to come back to your to your point I, I think we, we would be looking at those uh, our our sort of the, the driving factors in, in the site plan. But if you think about access uh, EMT calls to Linden Chambers, we can make some assumptions that some number of them are for uh, frail elderly falls, right? And so if nothing else, improving the accessibility of units might, might reduce those. You know, you won't necessarily do anything about heart attacks, but getting rid of tubs and having walk-in showers could do a lot for yeah. seniors not falling and breaking their hips. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I, I do want to be sensitive to time. I guess the yeah, question I had maybe for Reg, mm -hmm. um, did you guys think of going bigger? So part of what we do in the conceptual design stage is to uh, have Dan's team figure out what is the maximum amount of apartments that the site could support. And right now that answer is around 300, 330. Uh, but it would require more height like uh, and more massive buildings and what is otherwise a very bucolic residential neighborhood. And of course we have the street, uh, the school across the street as well. So there, there's that kind of a balance. There's, there's sort of, you know, a, a balance for density, you know, what can the site support in theory, uh, but um, what what is appropriate, you know, in terms of being a, a you know, still being part of the, you know, and a need data there. And, um, and of course, then the demand for uh, affordable senior housing is huge, our waiting list and growing. And, and it's about, what's about a thousand people on the waiting list. Just wow. You know, for these little, small, insufficient apartments here. Right. And, um, and, um, and of course, we just had the housing uh, plan come out last month, a couple months ago, and it documented you know, a huge need in every income category here. And then there's the question of project economics. Um, and then, you know, unavailable funding uh, is, is a big stretch for this kind of a project. The state has a couple hundred other developments that are just, you know, probably in worse shape than we are, uh, if you can imagine that. Uh, we're actually considered uh, one of the best, you know, sites in, in the Commonwealth, uh, you know, but so you can see. And and the money just isn't there, so that's that's it. And ultimately, all those factors so need to be balanced. Yeah, and I assume you did due diligence. I guess I'm just saying it, it seems. I know there's a growing need, and so it seems to me you're not asking for a lot. It seems like a modest ask in terms of the number right. of units. Not not an outrageous. Yeah, so it sort of seems to be gravitating at this point of the conceptual design in that sort of 250 range, which would be a 100 additional units, which is you know a huge win. When, when, and when you consider they're all now completely accessible, full elevator, you know, mm -hmm. all the other problems we all know about the site are gone, you know, in three or four years, that's, that's a huge win. And I think, you know, testing kind of that back building on the chamber site is potentially a spot where I think Dan mentioned you could potentially go a fifth story and not really um, impact <coughs> the, the neighborhood. Um, in visually, I mean, you still have traffic that you need to account for. Sure. And I think the balance around um, height in open space is, it, you know, it would be great if we could tuck the parking underneath the building and create more open space, but we would lose a whole, all of the units on the first floor. And if we're, if the neighborhood is sensitive, particularly on, on London Street to height, and, and we can only go three stories, you know, it really diminishes what we're able to do. And, you know, I fight really hard for buildings with elevators, but buildings with two elevators, not one, because there needs to be redundancy, because it doesn't make any sense to have 
a, a building and, and have the LFA to break and, and then you're in even worse position than what you started. But the state really pushes back if you don't hit a certain unit count, they won't fund you for that second elevator. So it's it's you know trying to you know juggle those balances, but also to create an, a living environment that is going to really maximize a person's ability to be successful to remain in the community. I think that's helpful. I think you know the board has taken positions and probably will take a position later this uh, morning on the importance of housing, the importance of affordable housing. And so this seems like a great step. I guess my only thought um, from my seat is mm -hmm. if there's a way to go a little bit more, I appreciate it. You know, it seems like you're being very reasonable and, and yeah, you can take a little bit. <laughs> and I will say the idea of having a commercial kitchen there and one of the heights allows for some redundancy. Yeah, I would, uh, I would say would if you us. solve it there, I wouldn't give up on doing it here. Yeah. You know, I really feel we have one property and we're starting our second property in Cambridge in our um, low-income affordable, elderly affordable developments where we have a meals program and it's a game changer in terms of the quality of life that it offers mm -hmm. residents, yeah. both in terms of the social element, but then also the quality of the food. And, uh, and we really, you know, particularly coming out of the pandemic, um, have really put an emphasis on um, uh, really increasing and in, in providing access to those kind Absolutely. of services. All right. And anybody else got any questions? We need to kind of. Yeah. Hold on. Thank you. Oh, stay Thank tuned. You. Okay. And okay. And okay. When we have uh, um, more, you know, something really figured out, probably towards the end of the summer, we'll probably want to come back and show it to you. Well, you're welcome. Yeah. 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 Have a great day. Thank, okay. you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. agenda I and mean, I guess we'll get our people back up here. Thank you again. Thank you. So Mr. Chair, the next agenda item, uh, the board has held uh, multiple discussions and multiple public hearings about revisions to Article 11, uh, yep. laboratory safety, biosafety. Um, we have uh, presented in the packet um, that incorporates the board's feedback. Uh, as well as some additional comments and feedback that we've received. Um, there are a couple questions we wanted to clarify with the board. Um, Julie, do you want to go over those briefly? Yes. Um, so under uh, section 11.3, um, the guidelines, yeah, I think there are a few things that, that you sort of wanted your, um, wanted to make sure we were definitely on the same page about. So under guidelines, um, no, I'm sorry, under the Biosafety Committee, we added a, a component that said members are selected through an application process, and we added just sort of a little um, sort of qualifier there um, that members are selected through an application process based on their professional experience or advanced degree or doctoral level studies in biotechnology, RDNA technology, public health, or another related scientific field. Um, to give sort of a qualifier, but keep it kind of open-ended enough that we aren't um, limiting based on um, educational field or experience because it comes broad. Um, the other part, and these were, I think, largely suggestions from the town council, um, is section 11.5.6. Um, town council had actually pulled this from uh, another municipality's um, biosafety regulation, and this same blurb appears in several other municipalities' biosafety or biotechnology reg uh, regulations. Um, that sort of adds this qualifier that clinical laboratories, like you know those at PID, um, um, healthcare facilities sort of professional services, veterinary facilities, and educational institutions utilizing only commercially available molecular biology teaching kits that are BSL-1 are exempt from this policy or this regulation. The board had said previously that it was looking for even level one labs to register. Um, not that we were looking to put onerous barriers on them, but we were looking for them to register. So that suggestion from town council is different than what the board had said. So we want to 
figure out which way the board would like to go on that. Well, I don't think this is necessarily separate. This is basically just saying if you're an educational institution, you're exempt, right? Or a healthcare facility or yes, but before you said you wanted. No, they would, many of them, I mean, they, they'd well, always be operating at the DSL level one. Yeah. Right. If, um, if they're separately, you know, this is a commercially available, basic, you know, commercially available kit that's been there. Yeah. Um, I think what we wanted is we want to know that they're engaged in it. Because if there's an issue and we need to send somebody in, we need to know what we're doing. So I don't know if there's a way to exempt them from the regulation, but still get the information. Um, and I guess that would probably require some more exploration. Um, and just so I understand, so this would be, say you have a Beth Israel, you know, primary care practice that has a little lab in it or something like that, that's doing, you know, testing or things like that, or it could be the, the hospital itself or you know, veterinary practice, but that's, Kind of a use case here, or it could be the high school AP bio, right? Right, exactly. That would be the educational institution gotcha. component is like in your general biology class in high school, you often do something that's commercially involved from it. Transforming E. coli with plasma, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the board had indicated that it did want sort of to have everyone registered. Um, many communities don't choose to register labs at a hospital or the bio lab at a high school. So that we'd like the board to tell us which way you'd like to go on that. I, I, I think we should know what I, a bio lab at a high school, that they're doing something like that, right? I don't think they may necessarily, because it's BSL one, uh, have to comply with all the, the whole regulatory route. But I think we need to have Information that this is going on there. Um, I don't know. Or should we just assume that it is? Yeah. Yeah. Any AP bio class in high school these days want to do that. So. I would assume that it's there because I, I worry about the regular the uh, administrative burden of trying to get the paperwork for everybody and track it. Right. I mean, that, puts it, that to, to make them comply with all of these regs. Is owners, is, yeah. is owners, and, and you know, it's put more of a burden on high school teachers. Yeah, and they're already overworked. Yeah, so well, I'm comfortable with this. this. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I thought you could add is you know just going back to your you know um, eleven three the biosafety committee. You don't need to say we're doctoral. Yeah. Based on professional experience or advanced degree level studies in biotech. Yeah. I think that works. Do we um. And this is just a question. Do we want to say that members should live in Needham or does it really matter? That's a good question. Historically, for most town boards, um, people were appointed our residents of Needham, uh, but the board could in its discretion choose to, I don't know, could, could choose to have a DPH expert who lives in Dedham be on the committee if it wanted. Um, we could certainly add that qualifier. Um, they leave it open ended for now because we don't know how many people are even going to apply. Um, and maybe there's a preference for people who live in Needham. I mean, we have control over it anyway. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't think you have to necessarily state so, that. Yeah. Right. We can just leave um, it. And the other thing, is, quite frankly, the, people, the, the number of people who live in town that I know who would qualify to work on this point extends. <laughs> you, could, you, could you could throw a rocket. They somebody. just have to apply. Yeah. That's the thing. <laughs> We've actually had a couple of people who submitted comments or have made sort of um, have proactively said, you know, I'm interested in this. If you're going to look for people, please consider me. Mm -hmm. Last meeting, I think there was somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. And then the last section was 11.8.3. Uh, Tim, I think this is sort of. Yeah. So this is typical language. Um, basically agents of the town. Um, so I, I am the Board of Health agent and I'm empowered to act on your behalf and with your statutory authority. Um, I can designate people. This does delineate and make clear that the fire chief can go in and the building commissioner can go in for sort of their elements of you know, fire safety, for building design safety, um, 
So it kind of stands to reason. It's the case in almost every regulation. Yeah. Um, so I, I just wanted to highlight it for you, but basically this is how the town does it. I can't see a scenario where the building commissioner would want to go in on something that wasn't related to basically making sure the roof doesn't fall in. Um, yeah. Or that the plumbing is fits the uh, plumbing code or something like that. The town also has a very close working relationship with cross departments, so I don't worry about. I, we would have very close collaboration if there was ever a concern from another department and they would be brought in way early in the process. I did include in uh, just a handout for the board some correspondence uh, that I had with town council. It was prompted by Tejal, your question. Um, you don't see that. Exactly. It's uh, you didn't. It's, it's printed. Um, yeah. Basically, Tejal asked the question about zoning and the interplay with the Board of Health regulation. The, the long and the short of it is the Board of Health has the authority to restrict the level. So to say mm -hmm. level four is off the table, level three is not allowed without a variance, which will require a full notice public hearing and public comment period. Level two and level one are subject to an application, but can be essentially done by right, for lack of a better word. Um, so town council clarified that. Currently, there is not uh, in the town zoning any distinction between different biological laboratory function levels. Um, I don't know if the planning board is looking to potentially adopt one, but this would be a way to address some of the concerns that have surfaced in social media on the town that someone could go into an area that is zoned for laboratories and build a biosafety lab level four. We know for a number of reasons why that's not going to happen, but that has been a concern that's been articulated in social media. And this would, the Board of Health regulation when adopted would ensure that A, level four is off the table, B, level three is off the table unless there's a very public very detailed variance process for um, And the board obviously has discretion at that point to hear the variance and say, no, we're not going to grant a variance. Yeah, I mean, I'm basically, the public health law allows us, when it's, when it's a public health issue, uh, we preempt these other courts. Yes, but I think the just partially to address the concern that was circulating on social media, this would stop a laboratory if it, you know, Again, we know it's incredibly unlikely, but this was some of the concern on social media. A laboratory coming in and operating a very complex function that people are worried about would you know, cause an outbreak scenario. Um, you know, they were worried about level three as well. And again, this was just, yeah. there was conversation that the, that the planning board could just you know, approve this with, you know, with no uh, oversight anyway. So I just wanted to make sure that our, what we were putting here really did of that um, authority. I think things get a little stickier where the planning board could technically allow the use of a level three lab, but the operation could not occur. So someone could go to the trouble of building one, but unless the Board of Health gave a permit to operate, okay, they would just have a very expensive building sitting there. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, I, Julie did the research, but I think were there eight or 10 total BSL three labs in the state, like, it's a very modest number. Yeah. Um, yeah. It does not seem like that it would be an immediate issue in need. Mm -hmm. yeah. children's hospital in a hideously expensive build of the operation. Yeah. Not that many people are going to, it's just not, not likely to happen. It does with the open. Great work on this. Yeah. Okay. Um, obviously, if the board wants we can make changes um, with any regulation the board can choose to revise at any time um, we think it does it, it did go through town council there's some sections on confidentiality he tweaked some of the language to make sure it aligns with the rest of the town but most of them were sort of very minor changes um, it did incorporate the public comments that we had received previously from uh, the h and e's consulting with skillman um, so we, we believe it's ready for the board to vote. I, I will note, um, just because it's been noted before, 
Dr. Brown uh, had ex uh, recused herself from discussion, so she's not going to be part of the discussion with vote. Um, so it would just be the four board members. Okay. Um, I think I'm ready to vote right. on this. We need, we need to get these in place, and if it's some minor tweak later on, we can do it. Well, so I'll move that we adopt Article 11 on biosafety regulations with the, I think, single amendment that we made to remove the words or doctoral. Um, in 11.3. Second. Okay. Uh, I will call the book the roll on this. I'll start with Rob. Um, how do you vote on the on uh, uh, biosafety regulations? Yes. Kajal. Yes. Stephen. Yes. And Edward Cosgrove. Yes. So the, the uh, regulation is now passed. And we can move on to our next agenda item. Uh, Mr. Is... Chair, if it's okay, maybe I could take one item out of order just because it would be fairly quick. Sure. Um, Claxton Field, we did get test results back, yes. um, extensive test results back. The yeah, test so results. Just, just <laughs> yeah. uh, and DEP still wants more testing. Um, mm -hmm. The test results, um, for lack of a more detailed explanation, confirmed what we suspected and the plan we had to remediate it, uh, which is manage on site, on a textile membrane, import clean fill. Um, it is unfortunate that we're going to have spent a fair amount of money and then a fair amount more with all the reporting to do the containment method uh, that we had come up with originally. Um, but we avoided the more complicated scenarios of where the field would have to be, you know, shut down for years or potentially permanently closed. Um, with these safety measures in place, it is safe for people to use. Um, so we'll continue to proceed with implementing those and, and following all the DEP um, requirements under the Massachusetts Contingency Plan, uh, which was triggered because we did the testing that they required. Um, right, I mean, you found dioxin yeah. at a deeper level. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and, and that's why we have to put the DOTEX on membrane and cover with additional fill. Um, but a fairly happy result. It was the sort of what we thought and the plan we had to mitigate it was what is recommended. So the field won't be used until the membrane is in place and the fill is put on top of it? No, the, the fill can be used according to DEP and the licensed site professionals. Um, they do want a geotextile membrane installed and additional fill imported, but um, topical use like running on the grass is not a threat right now. So the field can be used for the current season. Okay. If you're going to take a 10 foot hole to put in coal posts or something, then you'd have a problem. Or lighting. Yes. Or lighting. And what was the timing of doing that work in terms of the additional fill on the membrane? I don't exactly know. I think DEP wanted some additional tests on the perimeter of the site, um, but the my understanding is that they will have the uh, baseball and softball season and that uh, in the summer or the fall they will proceed with renovations to the field which will include laying down the geotextile membrane and importing clean fill the town had put aside funding separate from environmental health related issues for renovations to a number of its playing fields including uh, mcleod and claxton thank you sir. Any other questions on that? Okay. Then uh, we'll move on to our discussion on um, ADUs, accessory dwelling units. As the chair knows, the Council on Aging, as the chair is on the Council on Aging, uh, yesterday took a position supporting the article at town meeting. Uh, so the Council on Aging is going to issue a letter essentially saying housing is important for seniors. We think the accessory dwelling unit bylaw should be you know, revised and loosened, for lack of a better word. Um, we took a stab at, uh, and Lynn primarily, um, a policy position on accessory dwelling units. The board took a position uh, when the ADUs were originally considered, so it did a policy position on accessory dwelling units previously. Um, this policy position is largely supportive of it. It does note one sort of point of objection, so first of all, we have to see if the board agrees with being supportive, and then we have to see if the board agrees with that one exception. Um, but the public health division staff, at least, don't love the definition of family. That's something we, both the public health division and the board, objected to last time. Um, 
basically that the zoning bylaw defines what is considered a family and that's not what we consider the appropriate role of government. Any comments on this? I thought the letter was good. Well, I have to think the letter was pretty good as well. Lynn's a good writer and it's a topic that we spent a lot of time on. The board, um, I think, remembers we spent a lot of time advising town meeting originally by talking to 10 communities that have ADUs and they all sort of said, learn the lessons we learned. Don't start off too strict. Don't do it this way. Don't do it that way. Need them to all of those things. And now is looking to make essentially the changes we were recommending to them five years ago, which is fine. Um, I think our hope is that with these changes, more people can actually take advantage of it because the number of people who have ADUs in the um, um, certainly wouldn't fill the gymnasium. At least, at least, at least, wouldn't fill this conference with me. At least ADUs that are uh, we know about. <laughs> yes, well, but I mean, you know, but one of the concerns is you know you, you wind up with Airbnbs throughout the town. Yeah. Right. That's what that's what they're trying to sell yeah. here. And exactly. So I mean, you know, I, I, I I'm just going back and forth through the actual zoning bylaw where they did try to loosen it up a bit. You know, and marriage doesn't do the same, you know, um, same sex marriage and all of that in the state. So, you know, that's not an objection um, either. So, I, I kind of I see both sides of this, mm -hmm. is what I'm getting at. Um, because as soon as you say roommates or, you know, some, somebody's going to claim, they'll, you know, they'll just make some sort of claim that, well, they're a roommate, they're a friend, they're here for, you know, emotional support or what have you. And now you've got an Airbnb, essentially, right? Um, so I get that. So I'm not sure if it, you know, I, I would like to see if we have an objection to that, that we actually have alternative language. To the definition of family? Mm -hmm. So I, I think our, our original suggestion is you do not define family. That essentially, there are all sort of different kinds. And while there are potentially some people who would take advantage of that regulatory ambiguity, mm -hmm. there are also, people who would or groups who would fit into the category that would benefit from that regulatory ambiguity um, because their family is non-traditional in that way. Mm -hmm. um, the, the town's bylaw does have um, essentially time limits, for lack of a better word, uh, limits on the length of rentals. Right, which I think is the real way to get rid of this rather than, rather than the other. Yeah. I know that Kathleen even suggested maybe not, maybe objecting to that section. The only thing is by doing that, you sort of cut out the Airbnb. I mean, like Wellesley did and other communities do 30 day minimum rental, mm -hmm. right? And I don't, I still don't understand the family part. Why it has to be a family member versus a college student renting a <laughs> but <laughs> to support, you know, supplement someone's income. But I, guess right. I, I mean, the whole point is affordable housing, I thought, but. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we think one of the one of the things that is slightly improved is that, is that there is somewhat more agency afforded to seniors, but the idea that a senior doesn't necessarily want their niece or nephew or cousin to live with them or their son or daughter, but might want to rent out an ADU because they are on a fixed income and they need additional money coming in. Um, we didn't love how the original draft severely restricted seniors agency. The only scenario you could possibly have as a senior is if you needed a full-time caregiver or if you wanted your son or daughter to move in. It's better now. I, I don't know if it still fully respects them as having the agency, but it's better. We may find no, well, that's the original point then. of this, wasn't it? The original point of this was to allow seniors to age in place and if they needed to have somebody essentially move in, this was the option to allow that to actually happen. Sure, but, but some senior could say, I am perfectly physically capable. I don't like my nieces and nephews. That's I fine, then why do they need, but they don't need to have anybody move in. That wasn't the but point. But they do because they're income restricted. Right. And so yeah. they would well, have this extra source so, of income. So that, that, was a, that was not an argument that held enough sway with the planning board last time to convince them. To yeah, because it. that's, not, that's, that's you know, an affordability issue as opposed to a health issue. And you may, you may say, hey, this is, allows us to attack both. But the original was a health issue. Right, they can't stay here because they can't live independently, and accessory dwelling units were a means to allow people to remain as independent as possible. Yeah, but they can't stay independently, but still yeah, stay at home. You're right, right. Yeah. 
This is yeah. different, right? Now you're saying this is a financial issue. This is not a health issue anymore. Now they have a, now they just don't have the financial means to stay there because of taxes or what have you. And now they should be allowed to rent. That's a slippery slope. Well, I've talked to, but I've talked to a lot of people who say that's exactly why we should have ADA. Mm -hmm. But they, the taxes in the town have gone up mm -hmm. and they keep going up and take social security. Yeah, okay, it went up, but it doesn't go up enough to cover the increase in taxes and living expenses. And this is the only way they can do it. Mm -hmm. And I know people who are doing it anyway. I mean, I think it's broad enough with the caregiver term too, because when you get a college student, I mean, there's been lots of stories actually about college students kind of serving that function and getting yeah. a room in someone's house and checking in on that. Yeah, person. basically acting as an au pair. Yeah, no. or, or even just checking in on the elderly person, bringing food right. or groceries exactly. or whatever. So, right, I mean, but you have to think of this from their perspective, order. right? I don't want, if I'm a senior person and I don't require a caregiver, I don't want to have to pretend that the person I'm renting to is a caregiver. Yeah. I, want, I want sort of full agency. Well, no, I get it. I get it. Um, so I think that's yeah. what you, if we, yeah. if we brought this to the council and aging meeting yesterday, I think that's where you'd hear from some of the people. Who yeah, they don't want to have to play a game about it. But right. now that, that now, you know, they're not restricting that to elderly, obviously. That's right. anybody. Yeah. I mean, I could rent, you know, an extra room. I could rent yeah. the room over my garage to sell you long term. Yeah. Yes. It's a, oh, yeah. it's, a, it's a very different argument. I mean, I think that's something that plays out of town meeting. I don't know that we should take a stand on that particular part of it, but we definitely should take a stand on, you know, on allowing people to age in place by having these bills for okay. the elderly. Mm -hmm. I spent time in several Midwestern college towns and there's ADUs all over the place. And they they actually improved the character of the town. And I, I lived in one in one town and I did a lot of stuff for my little lady who was an older woman mm -hmm. you know, that she couldn't do for herself. And there's like a, the Airbnb founder is doing an ADU startup to, you know, deliver the, you know, like the pod, but it's, it's so it, I think it would I, go I, that way. I, I, I see nothing wrong with the web. That's great. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So can we take a vote to accept that text? So we need a motion. Second, anyone? Second. Okay, we'll take a vote. I'll start with Rob. Uh, yes, I support the letter and the motion. Yeah. Yes. Good job. Yes. Stephen? Yes. support this, yeah. Okay, and Ed Cosgrove, yes. Okay, so that's done. Tim, uh, uh, sorry, just so you know, the, the our 10 o'clock agenda people went to Rosemary by accident, but they are on their way. Okay, that's why I was checking, having Kristen check with the attendees, mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Uh, so we've got time 950 food grading system. Sure. So um, we're just here today to present a project that Ecom Lu, uh, who was our, our public health intern now is our food regulatory program analyst. Um, he's doing this for his capstone project, and this has been a wealth of years worth of information that Needham has been um, looking into as far as how can we grade our restaurant inspections in a fair way on both the inspector side and the, the owner and manager of the restaurant side. And um, as you can see, um, I can go through the, the PowerPoint first if you'd like, and then we can kind of talk about different uh, questions that you might have on that. But so um, we, we did do some, you know, some stats here on foodborne illness. I didn't want to spend too much time on that due to time. Um, but the goal again is just for to have this grading program also combined with our standardized food safety program, um, which would incentivize food establishments to maintain compliance with routine health inspections um, and also raise awareness about proper food safety practices um, in the need in public. So again, this is going to be a combined effort as far as educating all our um, you know, restaurant owners and managers about this program and also the public on how we're gonna go about doing this. So um, the program logistics, as you can see, so it's a food safety grading system, which will be shared only with the restaurant. So it'll be like an internal grading um, system and they'll measure their performance against the food safety standards. So again, we're gonna pinpoint the priority violations, priority foundation violations and the core violations, which will um, add up to a certain percentage zero to 100 on their inspection reports. 
Um, it, and then they'll, but that can be incorporated right into our existing food co uh, program that we use to inspect our restaurants. And then these establishments um, will meet the requirements for food safety and receive a certificate of excellence if they get a 90 or above, so an A, essentially. Um, and so it will strive for them to get this certificate that they can post in their front window um, af right after their routine inspection and they get an A grade. So that is the goal for this type of program. Um, and then the grading scale, again, this was another um, avenue that we have vetted <laughs> profusely and tried to uh, come up with a fair grading scale um, where we would have a seven point weight on a priority violation, a five point weight on a priority foundation violation and a two point weight on a core. And that was initiated because we didn't want it to be a false assumption, you know, enabling a restaurant if they got two priority violations, would they still get an A? No, under this system, this would enable if we got a priority or priority foundation, they would only drop down to a B. So again, this is to incentivize our restaurants to be more proactive on their food safety protocols. So when we do our routine inspections, we're not writing up the same cold holding violation, you know, which would trigger them to get that um, B. So that is the goal for this. Um, Again, we, we always, Needham always takes a, a stance on, on other towns surrounding us and what we're doing. We, we investigated Need, uh, Newton initially about five years ago, we met with them because they got a grant and they initiated their grading scale uh, program. Um, and we, we also investigated Boston who does, they do the letter grades as you know, and post those in the window, same with New York, uh, the letter grades. But then we talked to West uh, Borough and as you can see, um, I did include that documentation in our packet, but Westboro seemed to be a, a good fit with Needham um, as far as they do the same type of thing. They have a certificate of merit that they have, and they also checked Newton, and, and they didn't like that program at all and how it was very confusing. Um, but the certificate of merit is similar, um, so they also post uh, that in the window if they get uh, an A grade or higher. Um, so that is why we came up with that. Um, scenario. So if you have questions on, on that, but that's been yes. well vetted. Yeah. How long is this certificate good for? So we would put it in the window right after the inspection and it would last until the next routine inspection. So we can keep it up. Um, if they don't get a certificate, it, it's one of those things that, okay, well, our next routine, we're going to give you another chance to get that certificate. So, so we put it up and we take it down. We can do that. That's not been determined yet, but we, we could either issue it through our online permit system and have them be able to download it and print it, or we could print it for them. Um, but that that's something that we could talk about. We could do that in-house and, and it, issue. It sounds like that they get the certificate if it's consistently meeting. So is that going to be defined as, I mean, not just one inspection, but uh, maybe a couple in a row or something. So like if that. we went back on their next routine um, and they did not score an A, right, we'd have to take that certificate back and we would do that at the end of the and inspection. And then you inspect them a week later and they corrected whichever thing that was and now they do make it. Uh, so this is where it gets tricky. So with, with other towns, that. they've had this stress on them as far as Newton and the other cities that do these grades. They bug the inspector and say, you got to come back. I'm, I'm done. I got to get this A. You got to remove that, that B from my window. So I don't see that being one of our protocols. Again, we, we can try it this way and see if it works and always tweak it if we need to. But I don't want the inspectors to feel like they're going to get harassed to come back right away to recheck yeah, something. I want them to be able to earn that certificate. And that is what you got when you, we came and did your routine inspection. We'll be back in a few couple months. Um, as you know, we do our rate based inspections. So some of them are every three months. Um, and then if you do well on that inspection, we'll give you the certificate. Let me suggest that we maybe look at this more like we look at tobacco and alcohol as well, that we have a time period lookup. You need to have an average grade of X over such and such a period of time. Mm -hmm. If you have that, you get the certificate. Right, because I want consistent as opposed right, to- Right, exactly. So right. it's consistent. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, one, you know, your one next inspection, you know, and you can decide yeah. what that is, yeah. you know, yeah, guess what, we found something, all right, but that doesn't mean that they're suddenly horribly flawed, I mean, they've been consistently great, okay, yeah. you know, yeah. it's a complex thing, they correct it quickly, you go back, you know, we don't need to be taking things up, taking things down if they've had that consistency, right? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. So some type of a look back might be a better yeah. way to do that. Okay. I, yeah. I, I also noticed in the Westboro email, you know, the comment about they found that there were some differences in where facilities where English was a second language. Yeah. So I just think, you know, we should be monitoring that issue as well and yes, understanding if that's an element that we need to be cautious of. Yes, and that, that's why we're going to be promoting this. As you can see, the timeline, we have it all. We are, we're not doing this overnight. This is something that we're going to phase in. Education will be the first, you know, one of the first components as far as how we're going to get this word out to the restaurants before we even initiate this. So we would do a pilot. Yeah. Uh, I, so I have a couple of questions. One is, um, do we know based on this like priority scaling, like what if we looked back a year or two, what would we like? How many would fit in that category? You know, how many would yeah, get so a certificate? Can, and, yeah, I mean, you we don't want something that, that nobody data. can get, right? Right. Right. Um, so I, I mean, could be a little data analysis project, but it would be good to know, if, you know, where we're at. What's well, really going to be good to know is are people going to care? Right, and, and I feel like, you know, there, there are restaurants or, or vendors that um, do a great job. So they just yeah. fly under the radar and then others are the thorn in our side and we spend a lot of time helping them. So in, in a way, it's nice to reward that. Mm -hmm. I also would, do we have some friendly restaurant tours that we could talk to, you know, get feedback yeah. on it before? Okay, you, you have got Yeah, it. I mean, we we're so our goal would be to have like a, a set of 30 pilot type restaurants okay. that would be giving us feedback all okay. about this uh, initiative. Okay. So that would be one thing we could do is yeah. just have these um, certain restaurants give us that feedback as we go, yeah. how we can tweak it. So we wouldn't initiate this and roll this out live until we had all that data uh -huh. and feedback. Mm -hmm. Yes, and how it's working, education. Like I don't see every restaurant in town getting an A either. And then mm -hmm. that's like, you know, you're teaching a class and you give everybody an A. Right. I'm sorry, no. Um, right. In the yeah. same way with this, there's always going to be somebody who isn't going to get an A. Yes. There should be. Right. And, and you know, our hopes is to incentivize because we do feel like every time we go back to certain places, we're going to write up the same violation. It's like, it, you know, again, this will incentivize. We're hoping our, our restaurant owners and mayors to be more proactive. Oh, yeah, my inspection's coming up. I'll do every three months. I better make sure all my units are cold before I, <laughs> they could come anytime this month. And then yeah. we'd go in and see all the units perfectly holding at, at cold temperatures that they should be, you know, so that's where our goal is. Yeah. And they should be, be doing that anyway. <laughs> it should be possible for everybody to get an A. This is criterion based. This isn't a, mm, yes. this but, isn't a sliding scale. Yeah, I would want everyone to be getting an A. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. But I think you know we have to, you know, you want to make sure that they're not just playing to the test, but this is like consistent all the time as opposed to just when they know they exactly. expect it. True. Yeah. So that's all. And and I think Westboro has had great uh, feedback as far as the, how their program has been. So I'm hoping that Needham, you know, this is why we're kind of going towards that um, grading process. So we feel really good about that. When you say that's had great feedback, who have they had the feedback? So the inspectors have told us this. Uh, the, the inspectors so, like it, the restaurateurs like it. Does it make a difference with the public? Um, so I guess what I've heard is that, so we're going to actually be publishing these also on our website, the certificates. Um, and eventually the inspection reports too is what we're, we we're hoping. Um, and so that is something that the public, yeah, they go on there. They want to see where are these restaurants that are getting these certificates. I think it is important to them. We are going to be having our food advisory board meeting too and enrolling them, our stakeholders into this um, initiative as well. So we could get more feedback from them and other public um, feedback on that and see where they're at. But when we initially introduced it, I think we did bring it up at our last uh, meeting saying we're looking at this. They were, they seem to be on board with wanting to um, be interested in having us do this program. This is where we just down the road, I imagine if you're going to post the inspection reports, you need to get us out of one page. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I agree. So some of them are, yeah, there four or five one pages. page per restaurant. Yeah. You right. could use that number and just a prior number of priority and then just hyperlinks. If That's true. Okay. That's a good somewhere. idea. Yeah. Keep one okay. page. <laughs> yeah, we'll be able to work with our IT, IT department on that. And yeah. See how that will work. And I do think transparency is important, and transparency is definitely an a driver of behavior. So mm -hmm. correct for the restaurant yeah. owners. Yeah. Yeah. So that's um. It, so we did have a couple of feedback points. You've kind of given me a, ro a lot of good um, feedback already. So uh, we did. So Lynn, again, she's been awesome in helping us um, have this um, food comprehension 
program document um, that we've drafted. It's a Needham Comprehensive Food Safety Program is what we've named it. Um, so again, this, inc this incorporates our already um, approved um, comprehensive um, food safety document, the food code enforcement document that we already looked at. And then it kind of ties in the grading document into this, um, into this draft. So we just wanted to get your feedback on that draft document. Um, it kind of rolls everything together as far as what this program will be about. Uh, so that was the first feedback point. And then also if you had any suggestions about community outreach, um, we also, we obviously have our own avenues where we can get this out online, you know, via the, the farmer's market, we use that as a great venue, the, the street fairs. Um, so I don't know if there's any other areas, Neon Cable, we can do some slots with um, PSAs. I have a suggestion on the name. Okay. Um, comprehensive is a word that get, gets used a lot. Um, this program is about excellence. So I would suggest the Needham Food Safety Excellence Program. Oh, okay. I like, I like that. that. That sounds good. I like that. Ties in the green certificate. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? We're running a little bit late. So. Thank you. Okay. And we'll move on uh, talking about um, the uh, single use plastic bags. I think we have some visitors. Morning. Morning. Thanks for having us. Occasional thanks for setting this up. Sure. Yeah, basically, we were interested in just connecting with you. Uh, can you introduce yourself? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, my name is Rob Fernandez. <laughs> and I'm Kathy Reyes, and we're both from Blue Needham. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we live in, uh, live in town and have been working with Green Needham Collaborative to um, propose and bring a plastic bag uh, bylaw to town meeting. It's a citizen's petition that, would be, that will be voted on by town meeting members in May. Um, and, and I can go at a super high level and pass it to you. Yeah, so basically we're proposing um, to get rid of plastic um, shopping bags that are distributed or can be distributed by uh, retailers and restaurants in town. And it's a follow-up to the voluntary policy that was passed by the select board five years ago, where the largest stores of um, 3,500 square feet and above voluntarily committed to stop using the thin plastic shopping bags. Um, some did that, some didn't, and then some started using the thicker plastic bags, which we believe is causing even more plastic waste and kind of going, going against the whole spirit of, of, of the policy. Um, I can leave it there. Yeah, you know, so this, yeah. this plastic bag ban would um eliminate all plastic bags, uh, both the thick and the thinner ones um, from all retail spaces, no matter the size, um, throughout the year. And it doesn't prevent the use of paper bags. It does not prevent the use of paper bags, but it does specify that- Does this qualify or not? That would be a reusable bag, so. What's this made of? Plastic. Does this qualify or not? <laughs> does it qualify as something the store can give out? Yes. Yes, it does. Because that's made out of polypropylene. It's not made out of the um, the low or the. And how does somebody know this is made out of polypropylene? So we specifically say in the band that it has to have stitching, which you can see on the which, side. Right. Yep. yep. So it, has the it um, if it has stitching, then we consider that to be a reusable bag. Regardless of the type of plastic. That's right. That's right. Interesting. If polypropylene is the is generally um, the type of plastic that is used for those types of bags. Um, the uh, HD, HDPL, and uh, the um, oh, I've, I've got them all here. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm littered with yeah. these, yeah. right? And, so that's the yeah. high density, I mean, and then you know, the, the thinner ones, ones we want to get rid of. These we want to get rid of, and and those are, right? Yes, okay. But then you have <laughs> stuff like you have stuff like this, and yes. you know, CVS is you know, tried to do this. This is 80% post consumable and recyclable. It gets 125 uses, you know, in theory. In theory. I mean, in just theory. because it says yeah. on the back that it gets 125 uses, I, I don't believe that that's the case. Okay, I, I understand. But, you know, CVS Target, which went from that bag to 
this bag. Um, you know, I've been trying to do the right thing, but I agree. Those collect, but these collect too. I can't tell you, I've probably got like 50 of these, you know, in, in my home, right? And I don't know what happens when I throw this out, particularly with the plastic coating on it, or worse yet, some of them have a plastic insert. And I don't know what you want to do about the plastic insert, which is a very stiff plastic. And my guess is probably even less biodegradable than these, but I don't know. Um, not enough biodegradable. Not There you go. There you go. The so, series that you could use that many, many oh, yeah. years. Right. And yeah. that has a limited use. Right. And it's, you, you know, it can get recycled, but generally they don't. Right. I mean, my point, I'm totally with you on this. I think this needs to be, I mean, I, mean, it's, I think it's too late. Um, I mean, even you say, you know, most plastics, you know, are like this and aren't going aren't gonna to work, but you don't say all. So is somebody going to come up with a plastic that actually works that all of a sudden we're going to ban that? The other thing is you put et cetera in here and you do have polypropylene as being um, banned. That that is a line that we've, we've just been working with the Sierra Club, and it's so great we, we will, yeah, we will right. be crossing that out, or we will we will say potentially um, woven or unwoven polypropylene, so that it would allow for bags like this, like because this. that is the idea. Right. You got to get rid of et cetera, um, because that just opens yeah, a huge can of worms. Et cetera is in, in et cetera the is in three point twelve point one okay. section E, right at the end. So we got it says polypropylene, comma, et cetera, that is durable, non-toxic, and generally considered a food grade material. Okay, we can get it. Okay. Right. That's a great point. Yeah, that just opens up a can of worms. We we went to um, we looked at we looked at a lot of other existing bylaws of other towns in the past for language to use here, and um, and they definitely but, vary in, in you know, how detailed they are and how comprehensive they are. So we, we're trying to be as comprehensive as possible by listing them. Listing them out. Um, and there was something related to Board of Health specifically, I seem to recall that. Um, oh, about yeah, they want us to enforce this. Enforce this exactly. We're the, we're the so, so I know, Tim, you had had some conversations about that and uh, what's doable and not doable, or Tara, I don't remember if it was you yeah. or Tim, but. So I think our, our thought is, and this is how many communities have done it, is that we would do complaint driven enforcement. Um, without sort of additional staff, it would be challenging to do proactive enforcement where we literally go around and inspect every establishment that gets out of bag. Um, so our thought is that we would do complaint driven enforcement and evaluate after a period of, you know, 18 months, 24 months or something. Um, that would, you know, sort of presumably there's going to be a public awareness push once this is adopted because I know the phase in was until January 1. So it you know, will be adopted in. Or it may be adopted by time meeting in May, yep. but it wouldn't begin until January 1, 2024. Exactly. Um, presumably with that education campaign, people will become aware of it. And if they do get a bag that is not allowed, then they will complain. Um, but I did want to sort of say that that is our plan. And here, if there are concerns that you have on, on that front, it, it's what most communities have done, um, not all. Have most communities had the health department do this or select for it? Because we don't permit the stores. We don't. They're handing these out, right? That's true. Um, although so, we probably we probably inspect the majority of them because I would imagine food establishments. We inspect the food establishments, but we're talking like all retail here, right? Sure. Although you know there are only a handful of what, secondhand clothing stores and knickknack stores and stuff like that. A lot of and a whole bunch of alcohol outlets that we don't theoretically have control over. Well, we actually do go into a lot of them because a lot of them have a food permit, even if they're just mm -hmm. keeping limes from margaritas. Um, <laughs> or, no. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think I think it's just a question, right? I mean, it is an environmental issue, and from that standpoint, it would fall under our jurisdiction. But on the other hand, this is much broader than that, you know, and you, you need to stop this a little bit at some point. Um, so, I mean, if, if so I you think the department can handle this and the folks are comfortable with that and we all feel it's fine, sure. But I was thinking that this would be more, more of a general bylaw that we would fall into the select board rather than us, under us for enforcement. So, so I think um, this is my own opinion and it's probably worth a discussion with the select board. Um, the select board doesn't have staff that are out in the field. I think this is potentially one of the challenges with the alcohol regulation. Um, to me, when someone was telling me about this generally, I said, oh, it's got to be either us or the building commissioner that's enforcing it. The building commissioner isn't in buildings really after 
they open unless there's major structural damage or major renovation going on. Um, I think we can handle it, especially if it's complaint driven enforcement. Um, we can gradually work to sort of put into our applications for those vendors that we do permit a reminder, you know, essentially you can work into viewpoint cloud, like please certify that you are providing bags that meet the following criteria and you're not providing bags that meet this criteria. So we can start working that in for as sort of a reminder to people. Um, I do think it's worth a discussion with the select board, but the select board doesn't, and the time manager's office doesn't have a ton of staff, so I don't know how they go about enforcing. They would, well, ultimately it would fall, it, it, for that it's very recent to it ultimately fall to you. Um, although they would appoint you as their agents as well, just possibly you as their agent. Right. Is there a way to, again, not to try to add work, but you're already going into restaurants to do your, your food safety inspections. Mm -hmm. Could this be another checkbox on there as well? So it's a little more than complaint, but it's not hopefully adding much yeah. work to your already existing efforts. It could potentially be added to that inspection program. The problem is then all the retailers, you know, the food establishments may rightly complain that, you know, there's a different level of enforcement for food establishments as opposed to retail establishments. Um, and it's not public It's not, right? Well, it's not food safety. It's not food safety. Yeah. It's not food safety. Um, do we know is our waste incinerated in Needham? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yes. This so so it doesn't matter <laughs> if we're throwing away plastic. Yes. And I mean, yeah. Um, I get it from a litter perspective, but to sort of energy conservation, it, it takes a lot more energy to make. I use cloth bags and all that, but supposedly you need to use it like 170 times or something for it to quit the yeah, yeah. And then also when you put these fans in, people buy more small bags for lining their trash cans and things like that. That's kind of been shown in some pretty big studies too. Um, so I don't, you know, I, I get it. The writing's on the wall. The communities are doing this. It's fine, but I, I don't actually see it as having real environmental benefit other than litter, right? If they're blowing around. But, I, but, so yeah, I um, respectfully disagree. Right, it's like a huge environmental impact because most plastic bags don't get recycled. Um, but they get think, used and they get burned in a incinerator, which for about 10 seconds. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, recovers it's, although there, there, there are ways around that too. Remember we had a big litter problem, an environmental problem with soda cans. We created a bottle bill. Now you can argue whether or not that has worked or not worked, but there's a lot less soda yeah. cans, fewer soda cans that I know mm -hmm. on the streets now than we did, you know, 34 years ago. And I was oh, out, yeah. right. That's one method. I mean, where I think this really should go is you modify this so that every one of these is washable. So that you bring it back to the store, it gets washed, it gets hung on a rack, and you take one when you need it and you bring it back and it's washed and then it you use it, right? to <laughs> yeah. no, but and that would really, you know, from an environmental standpoint, if that's really the goal and from a waste standpoint, the problem is people don't bring the bags with them. You forget you're running an errand, you know, yeah, you're on your so way back common. home, yeah, right? Yeah. Very so we common. do have an have education like campaign yeah. as Chapping, well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm working with, uh, with all of the schools on an education campaign um, to talk to them about plastic pollution in general, and then also to, um, you know, just advise them about using reusable bags. I'm hoping that a lot of the, the students will um, come up with some signage and that we can put in stores to help remind people as well. And we've, um, some other people on the Green Eden team have been working to, um, with the stores to see if we can get more signage available so that we remind people and it, and it becomes a habit, you know, for people to just bring from their, their cars. It's happened in a lot of other states, so I don't think that this is something that we really can, can tackle. This is not a new thing. <laughs> do we need to change that language around the enforcement to be complaint driven, or do you think it's okay with the language of it, and that's just the way we do it? It's okay. I think you know the board needs to be okay with it, and Green Needham I think needs to be okay yeah. with it. We have the bandwidth to do it, and we can sort of reevaluate. Um, I think the the question sort of is is complaint driven okay, and what I'm hearing is yes. And then I think the only other question is, does the board wish to take a position when this article comes to town meeting? We're going to come to the board reorganization in a few minutes. Um, Ed is a member of town meeting by himself. The chair of the Board of Health is an ex officio member of town meeting, or I don't know what the right exact term is, but automatically is a member of town meeting. So the board would have potentially two people at town meeting who could voice support about ADUs, could voice support about plastic bags, so the board can choose to oppose, support, or take no position. Yeah, I mean, the way I read this in terms of the enforcement is we have, you know, 
broad um, broad discretion, right? It just says we, you know, yes, we have the authority to enforce it. Doesn't mean we have to enforce it. We have the fines available, right? And we can adopt and amend the rules and regulations as long as they kind of meet the purpose of the law. Yes, right. So, you know, I think if everybody's fine with you know complaint driven. Yeah, that's probably a reasonable way to go. Yeah. But you have to be to accept that that's that's part of what it would be. As yeah, I to. think that's what happens in many other other towns, as you said. I mean, I love the idea of having it added to the the list, you know, the checklist, so that it's not an additional burden. Yeah. But it, yeah. it is a reminder. If there's any notification that goes out to retailers from the board of health, it's you know every six months or so. That's why I think a it reminder would, that would be helpful. That's why I would go select board. I thought because everybody has to apply for like you know some type of operating from I imagine they're, they're run a store in town or do they? Exactly. Is there any connection to, to the town yeah. when people open a business? No, that's why I've had the problem with the testing center. Yeah. And you got to you know you, you want to try to attach it to something yeah. that they're required to do, right? And so they're required to distribute documents here. So I was probably the building commissioner. Yeah. Yeah. Or the people who are in the in in businesses, the next most often is us because mm -hmm. the majority of I mean, Needham isn't a huge, doesn't have a ton of malls, right? Yeah. Needham's majority of its businesses are food service establishments. Right. I mean, they're the biggest, they're the biggest uses of those bags. Yeah. You know, I mean, I didn't like, I I found plenty of uses for the little thin plastic bags and, and run. But an unintended consequence of that ban was something that's even worse. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I despise those bags. I'm just a staff member, if you don't mind. Um, we did this in Medfield, and you know the capacity of us compared to you all and what um, Tim's gotten behind in tariffs. So we supported and made a letter of support, but it just became a part of the normal course of business. And once people got the letter, in the letter from you know Medfield Energy and people who were really on board, and it hasn't been been a problem. It so as far as saying, do you have do we need have to go out and we might get a call, but the health agent, you know, in normal order of business, and um, we do get the phone calls, but there's not a lot of lift as far as enforcement and. I know you're a very limited capacity. I just thought I'd so say that. You're saying that, that. That tells us something right there. Yeah. And, and I'm philosophically in favor of this. Right? Yeah. So I, I, I do not understand why we need plastic bag. Take, why, what's wrong with paper? And everyone switched, and you know, just those little thin ones in Brothers Market and Shaw's for the produce that are there. Um, those are still. Yeah, yeah, and those are not available. Yeah, the yeah, it's yeah. just the, the takeout shopping. Paper is still a problem. It's yeah. a tremendous amount of energy to just uh, as part of your shared so services. Recycle. Yeah, um, but yeah, it's yeah, so. a huge cost to the environment. We feel like think about the whole life cycle of, like, of paper versus plastic. We thought we thought we talked about this a lot. It's like it's not clear. Like it takes more energy to make a paper bag, mm -hmm. and then the plastic bag really lasts forever in the environment. Well, paper by and large is recycled and biodegradable and biodegradable so if you like take the whole life cycle in, into account we we would like to think we believe that paper is better especially yeah, I mean, you don't know what you know it might be more carbon intensive and energy intensive to make a, make a paper bag and then you don't know what energy is being used in it maybe it's renewable energy you know, how much energy is being used to make the plastic bag very it's less. It's it less is better. less, but there's still air pollution and water pollution that is occurring when you're making any kind of plastic product. And then more paper product. Or you're going to send more paper product. There's still plenty of pollution to integrate right every time. Right. You oh, definitely. It's, but it's the lasting impact of plastic last. and the toxicity that is associated with plastic yeah. is far yeah. outweighs. It's, it's, not, it's not an easy, there's no doubt it's not an easy. Right. Well, you know, I do think um, I at least would be supportive of us being supportive of this at town meeting. Um, I don't know if we need to vote on that or what, what you would recommend, or I don't know how so everyone else would with, with the amendments. With the amendments. Right. Yeah. About polypropylene yep. and et cetera. Okay. okay. Yeah. We, that, that's in the works, the polypropylene. Uh, so we would do one of two things. Um, whoever is the 
uh, town meeting members could choose to speak, raise their hand, address the moderator. The board could take a policy vote to support the bylaw or the system decision. And we would do what we're doing with ADUs, which is you know, we put the statement on the website, we'd send it out over social media. Um, put a handout at town meeting. That's what people do at the table. Yeah, so this year the moderator has basically forbidden paper. Um, so interesting. Okay. I think a letter like the ADU letter would be reasonable. Yeah. The cable used to be there, but I don't know. Yeah. Okay. yeah. We can we can get around that by putting, you know, a stack of them in the hallway before you get to the hall. That's not part of the Technically the moderator is only king inside the hall. That's not bad. That is but I think you might incur the ire of you might not want to make them unhappy. Yes. Um okay, so I think we need to move on this. Next. All right, so I'm going to move that we endorse the draft bylaw, assuming that it will be amended as we discussed. And I'll okay. second that. You need to take a vote. Uh, do you want to start with Rob? Yes. Kathleen? Yes. Tishon? <laughs> yes. Stephen? Yes. And me? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's great news. Thank you. So you would speak at town meeting, I guess, in support potentially, or if that's something you would do. One of us would do it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You'll be the chair. Assuming I can go, but if you're there already, also. Okay. <laughs> we'll figure out who's going to be there. Oh, great. Well, thank All you. Right. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your time. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks All for right. coming. Thanks. Okay. Mr. Chair, we have staff um, reports which we need to do. We do. I know that there are a couple of people at a hard stop at 11. Um, I wonder if, and this is, I know the staff put a lot of work into the monthly reports. I wonder if we want to do questions only from the board rather than you know each member take a couple of minutes, each staff member take a couple minutes to report. I'm sure. Because we do that. <laughs> We've all read them. We've seen them. We've got them in our, our packet. Um, so let's do that and just ask if there's. Any questions from board members of the various staff members who are here? Yes. <laughs> okay, Steve. Uh, I have C. Mm -hmm. Vehicles. I see it's under five, but it, I assume it's a positive number. Right. So, because of the uh, our census for the town, the state wants us to now report diseases for five as. Or anything below five is less than five. So I can't really say if it's one, two, three, or four. Right, but, but do we have a, I mean, if we investigated that, is there an issue? How did there was a follow up needed for that one. I think that ended up being revoked. Okay. So just so the board's clear, the, this was an issue with COVID and DPH clarified it. They consider if there's fewer than five cases in a community of under 50,000, that it is relatively easy to identify the person. So they ask us to say, like we said, less than five. Um, I'm fine with that, but usually we just report out. It's like, okay, we investigated this. This is yep. a problem. This is not a problem. You know, we close this out. You know, what happened? Absolutely. There's more like that follow up. Yeah. Um, one other comment. Um, COVID public health emergency will end May 11th. Um, I'm just wondering if we make next month the final report on a regular basis. That was the 19th. That was the plan. The plan. Okay. And then, Good. and I think technically we're meeting on the 12th, um, the board scheduled meeting. Yeah. And then the June closing. meeting, um, Julie will include anything that's relevant to COVID in her EPI report, um, but it wouldn't be a separate deck. Um, and are we doing any um, outreach around ensuring people retain their health insurance and? We have done some outreach um, in concert with the, the social workers at the senior center who administer SNAP benefits. Um, they've done outreach as well. Um, the SHINE program has done outreach. Uh, obviously, a number of folks that are renewing uh, about paperwork. Almost every healthcare organization, public health organization I know, has pushed out you know, to their members via mailings and, and social media. I'm sure there are still people who are going to lose insurance and then it will take a long time to get back. Um, I know that the, at the State Department of Public Health, that is a major focus of, they've asked each department and division to figure out basically how they can help advance 
getting that information out there. Yes, well, the division of insurance is doing their best to make sure that they don't that it's costing the state a fortune. Sure. Yes. Kind of along those lines. Um, one is the after action reports that were done for COVID, are those available? Sure. And we get copies of those at the mm -hmm. what's in those. The other is the library still has like a rather misleading sign on the front door saying masks are strongly recommended because children under five can't be vaccinated. I mean, it's totally out of date still on the door, okay. still on their website. Um, and people who are unvaccinated should be masking their website says, which hasn't really proven to be an effective strategy, hasn't made a difference. Um, so if we could just ask them to either update to just make a link to CDC guidance or something, but not, they say the Board of Health says on the website. So that would be my only other um, comments. <laughs> I had a question or comment about the rice barn. This is, I mean, I know this is just continuing mm -hmm. using up our resources like crazy. Is there some way we can just finally come down and say it's over and done? Sure. Yes, I think the board has a jurisdiction to make that decision. Yeah, because this is, I mean, mm -hmm. it's just continuing and it calls you back and says everything's good and then of course it isn't. And then you just wasted half a day dealing with that issue again. Correct. Yes, yeah, so we, I was going to mention, we have not seen any progress from our joint inspection that I conducted with the building commissioner and his team. And actually, I, you saw the variance request that was submitted, which Larry DeBona, who's the plumbing inspector over in the building department, just was appalled, saying, why would he even try to get a plumbing board variance from the state when this is a local requirement? And he's like, he has not come in here to pull the proper permits for anything. No gas permits, no plumbing permits, no electrical and permits. He's just chewing up all time for all of the town. Now more, more than just us. Now yes. it's the building department as well. Yes. I mean, I think we should just finally say done. But maybe we can talk about that at our next meeting. It's because it's not time to do it now. Yeah. Yeah. And we can also figure out from town council what yeah, involves actually doing. Yeah, let's do that. I mean, do that. yeah, it can seem arbitrary if you put regulations out there he needs to follow them and just pull them over. Because I know what's going to happen. Yeah. He's going to get it minimally in together at mm -hmm. some point in time. We'll say, okay, you can open up and two weeks later we'll be right back in there again. Yeah. Well, no, I, I think I think one way potentially to do this would be, you know, if a permit is revoked, there's a reinspection fee and it's a reinspection every time you go in. So if it's like five hundred dollars every time you go in, it's like you want us to come in? Sure. We'll come in. That's five hundred dollars. Oh, you you bail it up front, you know. Yeah. And then the next time you come, it's another five hundred dollars, right? But we need to change the reg to reflect that mm -hmm. uh, for something like that. Well, so, you know. I had a question just about the um, about alcohol. I sent this to you last night, yes, Tim. Um, now that the town voted positively on question two, so that the select board has the authority to increase the number of alcohol outlets. Um, I realize that we actually have a fair amount of data from the Metro West Health Survey, and we should go back because I think that it, that predates Needham even allowing any alcohol in town. Needham went from being a dry town to not in 2012. We have much less data that go back to 2006. So it would be interesting to see, you know, what our rates of alcohol use amongst youth have done if there was a jump during that time how it compared to other communities as well, because if all communities went up regardless, you know, that doesn't really show us anything, right? So it's what was our change over time, particularly with attention to, you know, 2012. Because if we demonstrate that, yeah, yes, indeed, there, there was a jump there. And as we increased the number of licenses, you know, we saw our rates increase more than our surrounding towns in terms of background. There's signal there, you know, apart from the noise. Yeah. Um, then I think we need to, you know, continue to engage the select board rather carefully over, you know, what they're proposing, um, you know, and if we see that, you know, something you're going to increase the number you're doing for enforcement job, we have the evidence now that this is a health danger to our town, and we will take action on it, because you're not. We do have a little bit of good news. So, um, Carol uh, and Lydia put on a, a great forum last night about alcohol safety in Powers Hall. Uh, there was an alcohol compliance check on Wednesday, I think? Wednesday. Um, 
there were two failures this time instead of 11. Uh, so the check in December was 11 failures out of 27. Um, Wednesday night was two failures. Um, they were repeat failures. Um, so um, I do know that I got a uh, letter from the town manager's office, uh, CC to me this morning about a suspension of one group related to the December uh, violation. Um, so I think you know we can hopefully see repercussions on that. The select board did discuss this week the alcohol regulations again. Um, and I need to do some exploring of this. Town council came back and said basically that there, there are no, there is no amount of compliance check failures that can result in a revocation according to the ABCC's rules. Um, I don't know that to be the case, although we know that there's broader discretion with tobacco. Um, I assume town council is right because I think he knows what he's doing. Um, but it then behooves us to think of other ways, you know, if compliance checks, you can keep failing, we can't revoke your license. What else can we do in terms of proactive education? Can we offer tips every other month instead of twice a year? Can we? Um, we can shut you down for a year. We won't revoke your license. So, I mean, to, to play devil's advocate, I mean, that's what it is. But we need to think a little bit differently about enforcement, I think, as well. You know, if we, let's say we were to take this over, it's very, very different to suspend a liquor store's license for a day or suspend sales for a day as opposed to a restaurant's bar for a day, right? Or just the behind-the-counter tobacco section of a convenience store. Right? Correct, because, you know, one, like, really puts them out of business for a day as opposed to only a portion of their business for a day. So I think we need to, you know, if we're going to go down this route. We need to think a little bit carefully about that. And I think that's probably why the select board has been, you know, struggling with this, because you know when we say, hey, you know, we want to shut them down for three days, it's like that's that's a really consequential penalty for even fine wines, as opposed to you know the restaurant down the street when you just say your bar is going to be closed for three days. Big difference. One size does not fit all. Bar. Yeah, sure. And that's worth exploring. But I thought at least exploring that data so that we know what's going on with the youth. Yeah, it's yeah, a good time. research project. I'm happy to work with somebody on that. We have the data. And we can just plug in a regression. We should have the data. Yeah. I have the data. <laughs> Which preliminarily, just looking at it, there was actually a decrease right. from 2012 mm -hmm. to 2014, to 2016, uh, both in middle school students and in high school students mm -hmm. in current lifetime of uh, income gain. Part of like national trend to kind of like right, yeah, yeah. the question is what, what is it compared to the background right. you know, in the other communities? Mm -hmm. We have to look at yeah. what other communities in the Metro West region are dry towns, were dry towns then, and still are dry towns. Mm -hmm. um, so there's right, there's some more work to be done on that, right? Yeah, I mean, what's, the right what's the difference in the background? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, we need to go to brief updates. Sure. So just briefly, uh, Ed is on a, um, the safe working group. Um, we're meeting with our counterparts in Dover, Medfield, and Sherburne. Diana has done a very nice job getting people to the table. Um, one of the questions to the board, uh, resuming reorganization, the chair is who was invited uh, to the safe working group. If there is a change in chair, if Tejal was the chair, would she want to be on the working group? Or since we're halfway through, do you want to have Ed continue to be on the working group? That's one of the questions for the board to think about. Um, opioid stabilization fund is going to be on the town meeting warrant rather than a financial warrant article. That means the money will go into an account, but we will have to get town meetings approval to move the money out of an account. Um, we are going to start probably in June a sort of community engagement process. Um, to get feedback on community priorities and come up with like a five-year strategic and spending plan. Um, we would include uh, potentially the Board of Health summer meeting or maybe the first fall meeting. The board in that process, um, maybe sort of a report back on what we've gathered to date and then the board's feedback generally and the board's feedback on what we gathered to date. Um, so that's just sort of a, a heads up, it means we're gonna to have to, we will be a little bit more deliberate by necessity on how we spend and what we spend. So we won't be able to spend any money out of that until basically November at the earliest. Um, 
the last item is the Board of Health reorganization. Um, so it's entirely up to the okay. oh, I think we need to we, we traditionally reorganize after the town election. Um, and um, one of the new chair and the co chair and so on, based on who will be running the next time, next time around. Oh, and yes. if that person wants to. Right, that should be Ross Staff's leading in terms of the zero for re election. One of the, yes, yeah, so we can certainly do it however the board wants. Um, the It didn't work, it worked perfectly when the board had three members because then the chair could always be the person for re election. For right. five members, it's not possible to do it that way. Mm -hmm. um, but it's however the board chooses to organize itself. It's entirely up to all of you. So, Rob and Kathleen, any interest? I mean, I would be happy to do it. You could be part, and I have more of like a flexible schedule than a lot of you folks, um, but I'm fine either way. I don't want to step on toes if someone else wants to do it. Uh, so, uh, Kathleen, if, if you are interested, then I, I'm, I would certainly support that. Oh, but wait, now I have to go to town meeting and support the plan. <laughs> No, there's, there's that. been a vice chair maybe that's interested right. as well. You so, you know, that's comments. another point. Should your <laughs> vice chair just move up? That is, this yeah. is a whole new ballgame since we yeah. expanded to five members. Yes. And traditionally, usually the co chair <laughs> moves up. I mean, I'm happy to move up and have Kathleen be vice chair. I'm happy to stay as vice chair and have you be chair, whatever. Uh, I do know my, my availability is, I mean, you know not that flexible so like all these additional meetings will be a challenge for me so but that's why you have a vice chair but that's mm -hmm. and exactly so so you know if we right. want to do so it this way. safe working group that's something that you could say if you chose to oh you know we met for example monday at 9 a.m at the sherburn library that might not work for your schedule works out okay for ed so uh, you know it's been involved maybe you I want put to, a plug in yeah, maybe, maybe you could appoint Ed to continue working on the advisory group. Ed to continue. Yes. <laughs> okay. I've been, I've been, this is, this arose out of the uh, special commission on local and regional health, on which I sat, and then it turned into the SAFE Act because of Denise Garlic. Uh, so it's, I'm, I'm essentially like one of the uh, first uh, You should definitely be staying on it, yeah. <laughs> so, right, so. I, I think I see a possible solution here, all right? So I'm I'm going to propose that Tejal is chair next year, and Kathleen is co-chair next year, uh, or, or, vice, or vice chair whatever. next year. Because mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking the year after, it's Tejal and myself who would be up, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You will have just gone off as chair. Yeah. And then maybe Kathleen becomes chair, I would become vice chair yeah. the following year, because again, it's the election season and all of that. Uh, but that way we have some continuation in yeah. the roles. That's sure. a good idea. Yeah, that awesome. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that sounds like a good idea. So with that, I will move that Tejal become chair of the Board of Health and that Kathleen become the vice chair of the Board of Health. I'll second that. You get to technically lead the vote, but this is the last vote you're going to be leading for a while. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, um, Rob? Yes. Okay. Um, Kathleen? Yes. Jean? Yes. Stephen? Yes. And Ed? Yes. So motion carries. You are now the chair. Oh, well, thank you. Have fun. Congratulations. All right. It's, it's, it's good. And so do you want to officially? Uh, oh, that's uh, call that Yes. So motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. OK. Uh, Rob? Yes. Kathleen? Yes. Stephen? Yes. Ed? Yes. Pedro? Yes. Thank you, everyone. Right on time. Good. Well done.